Good morning everyone. Today we are going to continue with our uh, book club on the fundamentals of diagnostic radiology. Uh, today I will uh, present uh, to you uh, two chapters. The chapter about the skeletal don't touch lesions and the chapter about uh, miscellaneous lesions of the musculoskeletal system. These two chapters were originally presented by uh, Dr. Ivana, Muhammad, Ivana Qasim Muhammad. Uh, but unfortunately due to some technical problems it did not get recorded so I decided to repeat it myself uh, regarding the skeletal don't touch lesions the skeletal don't touch lesions uh, <coughs> are uh, lesions that are so radiographically, radiographically characteristic that a biopsy or an additional diagnostic tests are not necessary you know, uh, it's so obvious. You know the diagnosis from the radiology. You don't need to do any other tests or bi biopsy or surgery or anything like that. So these lesions uh, can be categorized into three compartments, three categories. First of all, the post-traumatic lesions and the normal variants and the lesions that are real but obviously benign. So regarding the post-traumatic lesions, one of the most important lesions should be that should be recognized here. Uh, is the myositis ossificans. The myositis ossificans usually happens uh, post-traumatic, as uh, the name implies. Uh, uh, it should not undergo biopsy because the biopsy, the histopathologic appearance, is so aggressive that it might mimic a sarcoma. So uh, it might need to unnecessary amputation and catastrophic events. So please be careful with that. It has a typical radi radiologic appearance of peripheral calcification with a lucent center, which is the opposite of what's expected of a tumor, like a sarcoma or osteosarcoma, for example. It has a, the osteosarcoma has a dense center and a lucent periphery, so be careful with that. The periosteal reaction can be seen in myosteritis ossificans as it can be seen on tumor, but biopsy should be avoided uh, because uh, myosteritis ossificans, as we said, might mimic a sarcoma on histopathology. For example, you can see here there is a mass, it has a peripheral calcification and the lucent center. And of course the calcification will be more obvious with CT scan. You can see the peripheral calcification here and the lucent center here. Regarding this case, you can see there is some ill-defined, featureless, amorphous calcification. We, uh, so it is not typical of myositis ossificans. It has not no peripheral calcification in the lucent center, it has the opposite. So biopsy was done here and it revealed, uh, revealed an osteosarcoma. Again, another case, you can see this mass here that has a calcification on the periphery and the lucent center. MRI was done, since MRI is not very good modality regarding uh, calcifications, it does not show the calcification well, it's just so a hyper intense uh, lesion adjacent to the bone. So CT was ordered and the CT was typical of myositis ossificans with a peripheral calcification and the lucent center. So please be careful with that. Other pathology of the post-traumatic don't touch me lesions is the avulsion injury. Avulsion injury can have an aggressive radiographic appearance, it can have a periosteal reaction, uh, some sclerosis, but because of their characteristic location at the ligaments and tendon insertion sites, they should be recognized as a benign lesions. And biopsy also can lead to a mistaken diagnosis of a sarcoma and should be avoided. Here, the important thing is that you guys have to memorize uh, the sites of the avulsion injuries, the sites of the ligaments and tendon insertions, because otherwise you will make big mistakes of diagnosing, I don't know, some sort of sarcoma or tumor or, thing like that, or things like that. For example, you can see here the ischium is a common site of avulsion injury. You can see there is some uh, periosteal reaction, some asymmetry between the two sides, and you can see that this is uh, can be recognized as a tumor, but due to its uh, typical location, it is uh, diagnosed as an avulsion injury. The same idea, you can see here there is a periosteal reaction, codman triangle, and some uh, missing piece of bone here, so this the presence of codman triangle indicates an, uh, an aggressive process, but uh, due to its typical location, it is diagnosed as an avulsion injury. Mm -hmm. Another pathology that should be kept in mind is the cortical dysmoid, which is exclusively only seen in the medial supracondylar ridge of the distal femur. This is the clue. It's in the medial supracondylar ridge of the distal femur. Many consider it to be an avulsion injury of the ductor magnus muscle. 
uh, might simulate an aggressive lesion radiographically and histologically it can look malignant so be careful the location is the uh, clue to the diagnosis the cortical desmoids occur as we said exclusively in the posterior medial condyle of the femur and it might may or may not be associated with pain can have a periosteal newborn and uh, formation and usually seen in young people and biopsy should be avoided in all cases sometimes can be seen as a incidental finding on mri of the knee with a characteristic appearance uh, and can have increased in, uh, radionuclide uptake on bone scans please be careful with that for example you can see here on the posterior uh, posterior medial uh, condyle of the femur of the distal femur you can see some periosteal reaction and some suspicious lesion it is it is just a cortical desmoid don't worry about it again here you can see there is some marginal sclerosis the exact typical location uh, and again it is due to uh, cortical desmoid another case you can see some lucency here on the posterior medial aspect of the femur and with MRI you can see the typical uh, location and the typical appearance of a T1 ISO intense and high bar intense on T2 weighted images regarding trauma in general it can need to enlarge cystic geodes or subchondral cysts near joints and can be mistaken for other lesions resulting in a biopsy being ordered so patients come with a trauma and end up with a biopsy and because the geodes from a degenerative disease almost always associate with additional findings due to degenerative joint disease like joint space narrowing, sclerosis, osteophytes, so the diagnosis should be made radiographically. You can see the geode associated with osteoarthritic changes like osteophytes, joint space narrowing, sclerosis, things like that. Keep in mind that these are associated together, the geodes and the, the, the degenerative changes. Also, geodes can be seen in calcium pyrophosphate dihydrate crystal disease, the rheumatoid arthritis, and, the, and, and, and in avascular necrosis. For example, you can see here this lytic abnormality, lytic lesion defect, and you can see there is uh, a loosened, uh, a loose, sorry, uh, there is an intraarticular loose body with some uh, osteophytes seen indicating a geode. This is a geode with a degenerative joint disease. Another example you can see here the subchondral geode the cyst here and here and if you look carefully you can see the osteophytes here and there and you can see a line of osteophyte at the typical location of degenerative de uh, joint disorder an entity that should be uh, remembered is what's called discogenic vertebral sclerosis which is confused often with metastatic disease of the spine uh, it's most often sclerotic usually focal always adjacent to an end plate it's associated, associated with disc space narrowing. Osteophytosis is almost always present. In fact, it's just a small nodule, a small nodule uh, in, in association with uh, osteophytosis of the spine. So it should not be confused with, with a metastatic focus. On occasions, it can be lytic or even mixed lytic and sclerotic. So, in the setting of this disc space narrowing, osteophytosis, focal sclerosis, adjacent to an end plate should not undergo biopsy, it's just a discogenic vertebral sclerosis. You can see here in this example, there is a joint space narrowing and end plate sclerosis here and there, and it's just a discogenic vertebral sclerosis, it's not a malignant lesion, no biopsy should be done. Regarding fractures, fractures will uh, will be the cause of extensive osteosclerosis and periostitis that's periosteal reaction we mean by that so it can mimic a primary bone tumor you can see osteosclerosis uh, periostitis resembling a primary bone tumor so the lack of immobilization will result in big exuberant callus which can be misinterpreted as an aggressive periostitis or even a newborn you might think of it so biopsy in such cases might resemble a malignant lesion again so you should not do a biopsy in cases of a fracture for example you can see here there is an abnormal exuberant periosteal reaction okay everywhere here and there it is very suspicious for an osteosarcoma for example it looks like some sort of aggressive appearance however if you look carefully you can see there is a slipped femoral epiphysis here you can see this slipped femoral epiphysis it's a sort of salter harris fracture so the Sultan Harris fracture was recognized then the cause of the periosteal reaction is known and no need to do any biopsy in this cases 
something called pseudo dislocation of the humerus should be recognized and uh, properly diagnosed radio radiographically it is a, a result in a fracture with hemorthrosis when there is hemorthrosis in the shoulder joint almost always there is a fracture will result in distension of the joint capsule and this will lead to migration of the humeral head inferiorly okay when you do an axial transcapular view, it, uh, there, it will show that there is no anterior or posterior dislocation. It's just inferiorly subluxation of the humeral head. As we said, almost always there is a fracture, uh, and if it's not seen on the initial films, it should be looked for uh, in the additional views. The transcapular or axial views is the key to making the diagnosis of pseudo dislocation. If necessary, the joint can be aspirated to confirm the presence of blood effusion. And when you aspirate the joint, usually the, the humeral head will return back to its position as the fluid is removed. As in this case, for example, you can see if the humeral head looks inferiorly migrated, it's not very well aligned. It's just uh, you, when you do uh, the additional view, you can see that the humeral head is in fact in place. This is the glenoid process and this is the humeral head. It is not anteriorly, not posteriorly dislocated. So it's just hemorthrosis. And if you look carefully, you can see the fracture here uh, as the cause of the hemorthrosis of the shoulder joint. A second category that should be dealt with and recognized is the normal variance. For example, there is something called dorsal defect of the patella, which is a normal variant described in the patella, it can be mistaken for a pathologic process. Uh, it is a lytic defect in the upper outer quadrant of the patella the location is the key uh, finding here the upper outer quadrant can mimic focus of infection or osteochondritis desiccans it can be a norm it is a normal developmental anomaly however because of its characteristic location it should not undergo biopsy on MRI it can have an appearance similar to many bony lesions like uh, which is uh, low on T1 and hyper and high signal intensity on T2 weighted images for example you can see here this is the patella and on the upper outer quadrant there is a focal lytic lesion that is a dorsal defect on the uh, sunrise views or the skyline views you can see the defect here and it is a normal variant normal developmental anomaly should not undergo biopsy on the MRI you can see the defect here it's very obvious it's hypo on t1 and hyper on t2 like we said there is something called pseudocyst of the humerus pseudocyst of the humerus is another entity that should uh, not uh, be confused with erytic pathologic lesions it's merely an anatomic variant caused by increased cancellous bone at the region of the greater tuberosity of the humerus that gives this region more lucent appearance on radiographs with hyperemia and disuse caused by rotator cuff problems for example or any other shoulder abnormality this area of lucency might appear strikingly more lucent and might, might mimic a lytic bone lesion you just the, the surrounding bone is increased and uh, leading to a false appearance of uh, a lytic bone lesion for example you can see here there is on the first instance you see a lytic bone lesion it's a very obvious lytic bone lesion however if you look uh, carefully there is no signs of cortical destruction the history here is very important it's just an uh, uh, immobilization of the shoulder joint mostly due to any cause of rotator cuff abnormality uh, this is a pseudocyst of the humerus it should not undergo biopsy it is not needed an abnormality or some say considered an abnormality some consider it a normal variant is what's called os adentonium uh, it can be a post-traumatic uh, abnormality it's just unfused dense that may move anterior to the c2 body with a flexion and can mimic a fracture of the dense many of these require surgical fixation the radiologic signs are recognized as an osodontonium are smooth often well corticated inferior border of the dense and hypertrophied densely corticated anterior arch of c1 uh, the thing is that when you recognize as an osodontonium you move the patient from emergency surgery of uh, fracture dense to elective surgery in order to fix the osodentonium you can see for example here it's migrating anteriorly with a flexion it's just an osodentonium it's this is the c1 uh, and the c2 and it's migrates anteriorly the third category is on obviously benign lesions first of all the non-ossifying fibroma which is in fact 
just a big fibrous cortical defect. When, the, when it's less than 2 cm, it's called fibrous cortical defect. When it is more than 2 cm, it's called non ossifying fibroma. Usually seen as a azelitic lesion in the cortex of the metaphysis of long bones. Usually have a well defined sclerotic scalloped border, a slight cortical expansion, almost exclusively found in patients younger than age of 30. So if you see it in more than a patient more than 30 years of age, then there is something wrong. But usually it is almost exclusively in patients less than 30 years of uh, age. After 30, it uh, heals by itself. <clears throat> As they heal or they involute, they will have a newborn formation, giving it a sclerotic appearance. Thus, they have come. They can show some increased radionuclide activity on the bone scans, and most often mistaken for an area of infection. Is in granuloma, fibro dysplasia, and urosmal bone cyst. These are the other differential diagnosis of uh, non ossifying fibroma. Infection, e.g., fibro dysplasia, ABC. So, they are asymptomatic and uh, have never been reported to be associated with malignant degeneration. Don't be afraid, just leave it alone. It's asymptomatic, it will go away by itself. Uh, sometimes it can lead to pathological fractures in these lesions. For example, you can see here there are two ossifying fibromas, one in the uh, femur here and the other in the fibula. It has a lytic appearance, very well defined, corticated, slightly expensile in a younger uh, patient. The epiphyseal plate is still open, so it's typical of an ossifying uh, fibroma. While here it is in the healing phase, you can see the periosteal, uh, the, the sclerosis here uh, in the healing phase of an ossifying fibroma. Uh, this will can show an increased bone scan and uh, bone scan radionuclide uptake and should not be mistaken for any tumor. Another example of a very big non-ossifying fibroma here, you can see it has a lytic appearance with a well-defined uh, uh, corticated lesion in the metaphysis of a long bone as we said. However, another uh, differential diagnosis in this case can include an erosmal bone cyst, especially if the epiphyseal plate is still open. If it abuts the uh, articular surface, then a giant cell tumor should be considered. Bone islands, uh, usually they are not uh, any diagnostic dilemma when they are uh, less than one centimeter in size, but when they are large, can be mistaken for a uh, sclerotic metastasis. Always asymptomatic. Uh, we have to differentiate it from metastasis by two uh, clues. First of all, the bone islands are usually oblong, that's oval shaped, elongated, with the axis, with the long axis, is in the axis of the stress of the bone. And the second clue is that the margin of the bone island, if examined closely, will show bone trabeculae extending from the lesion into the normal bone in a speculative fashion. It just merges with the adjacent bone. It does not destroy the adjacent bone, so keep that in mind. For example, you can see here, it's a big uh, osteoosteoma, uh, sorry. Uh, I'm so sorry, uh, it's a big bone island uh, that is oval shaped, elongated in the line of the stress of the iliac bone. So it should not be mistaken for sclerotic metastasis. It is just an osteoid, uh, uh, it's just a bone island, sorry. Bone unicameral bone cyst, uh, it's if it is in bones that are weight bearing or parts of the bone that are weight bearing, usually they are prophylactically prophylactically curettaged and packed to prevent fracture, okay? Uh, like example in the humerus or in the femur. But when they occur in the calcaneus, as in this case, you can see the cyst is in the calcaneus, uh, it should not be uh, curettaged, it should be just left alone. Why? Because usually it uh, occurs in the anterior inferior portion of the calcaneus and uh, this is not a weight-bearing part of the bone and they are they very rarely fracture in this case. Regarding bone infarctions, uh, it has different stages and early in the course of its development of the bone infarct, it ha uh, can have a patchy or mixed lytic and sclerotic pattern, can uh, resemble a per permeative process, uh, looks like aggressive process. If uh, the process can be seen to be multiple in the diametaphyseal region of the long bone, if the patient has an underlying disorder like sickle cell anemia, SLE, uh, uh, the areas of bone infarct should be considered. They have a characteristic MRI appearance and should not be confused on the MRI images. And also, uh, uh, biopsy, when the, film, when the platforms are equivocal, the MRI can prevent the biopsy. 
for example here you can see there is some sort of ill-defined lytic process involving the uh, diametaphyseal region of the tibia here and even uh, can be seen in the adjacent uh, femur here uh, it is sort of permeative process so query and uh, in the case in the history of this, this patient has a history of uh, systemic lupus erythematosus so uh, he's on steroid uh, MRI was done again you can see this very typical appearance of bone infarct it looks terrifying when you see it oh my god was that is typical appearance of bone infarct don't be afraid it's a don't touch lesion okay there are several signs called Chinese ink sign and uh, Chinese letter sign so this appearance is typical for bone infarct don't do a biopsy this this is the regarding the first chapter now we will start about the second chapter that's the miscellaneous bone lesions uh, the author of the chapter chose to uh, enumerate some of the bone lesions in alphabetical disorder starting with achondroplasia uh, which is the most common cause of dwarfism it's a congenital hereditary, hereditary disease uh, due to failure of achondral bone formation something important to notice here is that the femurs and the humeri are more profoundly affected than the other long bones the entire skeleton is abnormal but mostly is the femur and the humerus so uh, characteristically it, ha uh, it you should look for the spine the interpendicular distance will decrease in a caudal direction and while you normally it increases in caudal direction in the achondroplasia it decreases in caudal direction the long bones the long bones have a normal width giving them a thick appearance you can see here the interpendicular distance decreases as you go caudally as you go to the, towards the feet the interpendicular distance is decreasing this is very suggestive of chondroplasia uh, and you can see the flaring of the iliac wings here and there and you can see the uh, what's called champagne glass deformity here uh, so this is typical findings of chondroplasia the long bones they are short uh, with normal width giving them a thick appearance Another pathology is the vascular necrosis or osteonecrosis. Uh, it is uh, an osteonecrosis due to uh, interruption of blood supply resulting in bone death and then bone collapse uh, in an articular surface. The radiographic appearance ranges from patch sclerosis to articular surface collapse and fragmentation. Just before collapse, there is, will, you will see a subcontral lucency. Occasionally, it can be seen, not always, sometimes. However, this is a late and inconstant findings of uh, avascular necrosis. MRI will be extremely valuable in demonstrating the presence of avascular necrosis, the severity of avascular necrosis. Even when the plane films are apparently normal, MRI will show you the avascular necrosis if it is present. So, what are the common causes of avascular necrosis? These are, as in this uh, table, the trauma, steroids, renal disease, collagen vascular disease, alcoholism, and uh, idiopathic the avascular necrosis has uh, stages or grades for uh, grade 1 2 3 and 4 uh, it is not written in the book so we will not talk about them however I just want to keep uh, remind you that uh, you should know these stages because this the management will be completely different between conservative and surgical management depending on the grade of the avascular necrosis which we as a radiologist should uh, define so you should memorize these grades for example you can see here there's an avascular necrosis of the uh, humeral head uh, there is fragmentation of the humeral head with sub uh, with adjacent sclerosis this will result in a vascular uh, this is uh, the result is of a vascular necrosis of the humeral head on this uh, image you can see just faint sclerosis of the right uh, femoral head not very well obvious if you look carefully so MRI was ordered and it showed bilateral avascular necrosis both sides here and here here there is a hypo intense T1 hypo intense uh, bone uh, uh, of the humeral head and here it's uh, iso intense so this indicates bilateral avascular necrosis but in two different uh, grades so keep that in mind uh, the management might be different for, for the right side than the left side Another pathology is what's called hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy. Hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy, it's clubbing of the fingers, 
periosteitis or periosteal reaction may or may not be associated with with bone pain sometimes with bone pain sometimes not it's seen in patients with lung cancer mostly that's why called pulmonary osteoarthropathy other pathologies can cause the same appearance is the bronchiectasis gi disorders and liver disease so what are the causes of periosteitis or periosteal reaction without underlying bone lesions these include trauma hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy venous stasis thyroid acropathy and pachydermal periostitis usually these causes will result in a benign form of periosteal reaction that is a wavy periosteal reaction don't uh, think of it as a malignant or aggressive appearing periosteal reaction it's just benign appearing periosteal reaction for example you can see in this case of hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy there is <coughs> thick continuous periosteal reaction diffuse involving the fibula and the tibia in this case was the cause was hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy another pathology is millerostosis millerostosis is a rare idiopathic disorder characterized by thickening of the cortical newborn that accumulates near the end of long bones it usually occurs on one side of the bone has appearance called dribbling candle wax it looks like a dribbling candle wax it can affect several adjacent bones and can be symptomatic for example you can see here cortical reaction cortical uh, sclerosis on one side of the bone like a dribbling candle wax typical of neurostosis one of the common signs of neurostosis is the metacarpals and the metatarsals especially the metatarsals you see in the one of the metatarsals having uh, some focal cortical uh, sclerosis uh, accidental most of the times accidentally diagnosed sh keep in mind it can be a focal melorostosis another very important pathology to know about it's the mucopolysaccharidosis uh, there are a lot of different types of mucopolysaccharidosis the important ones are and the most common ones are Morkew, Hurler and Hunter syndromes so they are a group of inherited diseases characterized by abnormal storage and excretion of the urine of various mucopolysaccharides uh, like keratin sulfate in morcu and heparan sulfate in herler these patients have short stature primarily from shortened spine and characteristic plain film findings keep in mind that hunter is the only one that is x-linked inheritance all the rest are autosomal recessive hunter is the only one that is uh, x-linked look for the spine if you see uh, uh, sp uh, in the vertebra they show platyspondyly the vertebrae show <coughs> platyspondyly and look for a beak if there is a beak then this is a mucopolysaccharidosis okay which type of mucopolysaccharidosis look for the location of the beak along the vertebra if it is central then it is a morcu syndrome while all the rest show anterior inferior peak it will be more inferior if you see it here then this is anything but more Q. if you see it centrally then this is more Q. okay Herler and hunter syndrome show platyspondyly with a beak that is anterior inferior as we said and in the pelvis it has a similar appearance to achondroplasia with wide flared iliac wings and broad femoral necks the, fem the pelvis will look similar to uh, achondroplasia and the characteristic findings in the hands is pointed fifth metacarpal base that has a notched appearance uh, to the ulnar aspect you can see here for example there's the beak and you can see it inferiorly indicating it is not more cute it is anything else uh, it was uh, in this case it was a hurdler syndrome and on the hand x-ray you can see this notched appearance of the fifth metacarpal on the ulnar aspect typical of mucopolysaccharidosis another pathology that we should know about is the multiple hereditary exostosis multiple hereditary exostosis uh, also known as diaphyseal ecclesia it is not uncommon uh, affects multiple members of the family multiple osteochondromas or multiple exostosis uh, in the multiple hereditary form the knee almost always involved if it is multiple hereditary always the knee will be involved 
there will be something called under tubulation which is a widened diameter of the bone the bone will be wide under tubulated it's invariably present at the site of osteo uh, of exostosis the incidence of malignant degeneration is reported to be as high as, as 20 percent but this is a very gross overestimation uh, the malignant degeneration is extremely rare in fact in real practice i don't know this 20 percent is too much high the more axial is situated the lesion the more prone to undergo malignant degeneration that is if it is in the axial skeleton in the vertebrae in the ribs in the pelvis uh, they are more uh, at more risk of undergoing uh, malignant degeneration than peripherally in the upper and lower limbs for example you can see here there are multiple exostoses in the both femora here and there and of, as we said the knees are almost always involved you can see this uh, exostosis and the exostosis can be uh, either pedunculated or sessile both of them can happen again you can see here in the femur around the knee so this is typical uh, appearance of the physical ecclesia or exostosis regarding uh, osteoidosteoma osteoidosteoma it is a common uh, pathology we see it a lot uh, it's a painful lesion occur exclusively in patients less than 30 years of age so that it means that the natural history is involution it goes away by itself the uh, classically described as cortical based sclerotic lesion in a long bone with a small lucency that's called anidus so you see a small lucency called anidus surrounded by a cortical uh, sclerosis or thickening if the anidus causes the bone and the surrounding uh, uh, it is the anidus that causes the pain the cause of the pain is the anidus and the surrounding sclerosis also caused by the anidus so the anidus is very important to diagnose but the diagnosis of osteoma is not based on the presence of anidus so if you see anidus okay if you don't still osteoma is a possibility if the anidus is surgically removed or thermally ablated everything will go away no pain uh, and it will be complete completely cure however if it is in a joint or if it is intramedullary much less reactive sclerosis will be there and it will be more difficult to be seen okay uh, up to 80 percent of osteoidosteomas are located intracortically when the uh, the reminder 10, 20 percent will be either intramedullary uh, will be seen in the intramedullary part of the bone and rarely it can be seen in the periosteum when it's in the periosteum will cause exuberant periostitis a lot of periosteal reaction <coughs> so the nidus itself is usually loosened it often develops a tiny bit of calcification within the nidus in the nidus it has the appearance of a squastrum uh, as seen in osteomyelitis so should, you should be careful not to confuse uh, osteoidosteoma with uh, osteomyelitis if the nidus calcifies completely it will blend with the surrounding sclerosis and cannot be seen on most radiographs therefore you know uh, uh, the, that's we said that's why we said that osteoidosteoma is not diagnosed by the presence of an anidus. if you see it okay if you don't it can't be osteoidosteoma okay so it can be difficult to differentiate osteoidosteoma from osteomyelitis radiographically uh, and uh, cannot be reliably done using plain film CT or MRI so because the anidus is extremely vascular it accumulates radiopharmaceutical bone scanning agent so if you are if you did x-ray you did ct you did mri you did not diagnose osteoidosteoma and you are still suspecting osteoidosteoma to differentiate it from osteomyelitis or the bone scan the nidus is very vascular it will accumulate bone and the surrounding sclerosis will uh, it will accumulate uh, bones uh, radio pharmaceutical and the surrounding sclerosis also will accumulate radio pharmaceutical this will result in what appear what uh, what's called double density sign that's typical of osteoidosteoma while osteomyelitis the center is just a, a dead bone so it will not accumulate a radio pharmaceutical agent it will be only peripheral accumulation of the radio pharmaceutical and will, will be easily diagnosed as uh, osteomyelitis or osteoidosteoma so for example in this case you can see there is a cortical sclerosis here in a young patient the uh, epiphysis uh, the growth plates are still open and if you look carefully you can see a very faint lucent lesion that is typical of osteoidosteoma CT scan was ordered and you see the, the nidus here and surrounding sclerosis very obvious 
consistent with the diagnosis of osteo and osteoma. Again here, you can see there is just a cortical thickening. There is no nidus here. It's not seen clearly. So bone scan was ordered and you can see the double density sign. There is the nidus. It's highly vascular. The surrounding sclerosis also accumulates radiopharmaceutical agent resulting in double density sign typical for osteoosteoma and when the when it's excised surgically x-ray was done and within the excised specimen you can see the sclerosis with the central lucency that is the osteoosteoma uh, a pathology that we might uh, face every now and then is what's called osteopathia striata it is manifested by multiple 2 to 3 mm thick linear bands of sclerotic bone aligned parallel to the long axis of the bone it is usually affecting multiple bones, asymptomatic, usually an incidental finding. You just see some linear, thick cortical bands along the bone, incidental finding, it's asymptomatic, uh, that is osteo, uh, that's osteopathia striate. Another pathology is what's called osteopoikilosis. Osteopoikilosis is just multiple bone islands. It's asymptomatic, okay? It's an incidental finding. There will be multiple small 3 to 10 millimeter sclerotic bony densities, bone islands, affecting primarily the ends of long bones and the pelvis. It has no clinical significance, but it should not be mistaken with an osteoblastic metastasis. It is not metastasis, it's just multiple bone islands. You, like you see here, there are multiple innumerable bone islands affecting the both the humerus and the pelvis, and it's asymptomatic, it's just osteopoikilosis. One of the uh, pathologies that we should know about is the pachydermoperiostitis. As the name implies, it affects the skin and the bone. There will be thickening, it's a familial disease. There will be a thickening of the skin, uh, of the extremities and the face, with clubbing of the fingers, widespread periostitis. The periosteal reaction is similar to that of hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy, but pachydermoperiostitis, sometimes painful, while hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy is usually painless. Sarcoidosis is a non caseating granule motor disease, primarily affects the lungs. When the musculoskeletal system is involved, the hands are mainly involved, and the spine of long bones are infrequently involved. So mainly the hands, not the spine, not the long bones. It, was, it will cause a characteristic lace-like pattern of bony destruction in the hands, and multiple phalanges are affected in either one or both hands. Radiographically, it's so characteristic, there is no other differential diagnosis. When you see the less like pattern, you can see it's multiple phalanges are involved in both hands. Okay, and you can see there is some sort of less like, it looks like a net here and there of bone destruction of the uh, phalanges with what's called sausaging of the fingers. Uh, you can see the finger is sausage like, the soft tissues are swollen. This is typical of sarcoidosis. You don't need to do any other test. Regarding what's called transient osteoporosis of the hip, also known as idiopathic transient osteoporosis of the hip, it's a poorly understood disorder. Idiopathic process begins with a painful hip, no underlying disorder. Other findings, uh, with no other findings, just osteoporosis. With the osteoporosis being only seen in the involved hip, and this osteoporosis is painful. So you see osteoporosis in a hip that is transient and painful with no other pathology. In the MRI, it will looks just like a vascular necrosis, that bone monoedema, hypo on T1 and hypo on T2. The edema is typically greater than the vascular necrosis. You see the edema diffuse involving the whole uh, uh, a wide area of the uh, femoral head, more than what you see in a vascular necrosis. Uh, the transit osteoporosis of the hip it is usually self-limiting with a full resolution. It tends to occur more in males, and one of the recent studies showed that it occurs more in surgeons and in pilots, in airplane pilots, uh, and treated usually by rest. Okay, so if no rest is, uh, uh, if, if the patient does not rest, it might progress to a vascular necrosis of the hip. But if rest is uh, initiated, then usually complete resolution is the rule. A similar process 
is called painful bone marrow syndrome the bone is painful uh, the bone marrow is painful it looks like just like idiopathic transient osteoporosis of the hip but affects other locations like you, most commonly the medial condyle also can occur in the lateral condyle and the proximal tibia adjacent to the joint uh, also can be seen in the knee uh, in, in the distal clavicle in the ankle uh, can involve several different locations over time or simultaneously يعني, it can be affecting one place at a, some time and other place at the other time or can affect multiple places at the same time uh, when uh, this happens it's called regional migratory osteoporosis that is today is the hip tomorrow is the knee later is the uh, clavicle and so on uh, and as with as with transient osteoporosis it is self-limiting treated with pain management rest and protected weight bearing in order not to progress to any other uh, pathology you can see it here there is a sort of decreased bone density at the left uh, femoral head and with MRI done you can see on the T1 it is hypo intense affecting the left femoral head and after treatment there is complete resolution with no residual abnormality seen so these were uh, the these two chapters uh, thank you all and thanks you thank you Dr. Vana for your presentation uh, I hope uh, you had a good time with that and uh, in, in case of any questions you can ask on the YouTube channel and I will be happy to answer them see you next week bye